The most serious violation of the 2015 nuclear deal, the U.N. nuclear watchdog confirming that Iran is carrying out uranium enrichment at its underground Ford out facility. James Carafano from the Heritage Foundation joins us now. You know, James, I really think the headline is the fact that the uh, the IAEA, the U.N.'s uh, nuclear watchdog, saying that uranium of man-made origin was discovered at a location in Iran that was not declared by the agency. And this is the first time that they've acknowledged in a report, in writing, that the allegations that were made by the U.S. and Israel against Iran were true. In other words, they were cheating and they were enriching uranium at another site that they lied about. Yeah, there's an overwhelming amount of evidence that the Iranians have always been treating. And this goes back to the fundamental problem with the Iran deal. If you look at the preamble of the deal, Iran basically says there, look, we were never interested in getting a nuclear weapon. We deny that we were ever interested in getting a nuclear weapon. And and we have demonstrable evidence that that was a lie. So they, they lied before they entered the deal. There's been mounting evidence that they've cheated during the deal. So I don't know why anybody is surprised that they have not been honoring the deal since day one. But but if you talk to Democrats, you know, the, the situation that's currently going on is the president's fault. And they always say there was never any evidence that Iran didn't abide by the deal. We have Marie Harfon from the State Department, and she will say again and again, there's no evidence anywhere that they ever violated it. Does this now, having the IAEA say that they found man-made uh, uranium of a man-made origin discovered at a location in Iran, not declared to the agency, that's the exact phrasing from the report, does that finally lay to rest the argument that the IAEA said they were fine, they abided by the deal? Well, you know, obviously not, since, since we already had evidence that they were violating the deal. In fact, the Iranians came out and said they were enriching beyond the allowed level, and yet people continue to say that the Iranians are complying by this. But this puts us in a really interesting situation, because any member of the, the U.N. Security Council could go back to the U.N. Security Council and ask for a vote. And... And and that could not be stopped. It couldn't be vetoed by the Russians or the Chinese. And essentially, it would require the U.N. to snap back on sanctions. And that would be mm. devastating on top of what the United States has already done. I think that's going to happen you here do. at some point. It's bound to. I think the British would have already done it if they were done with Brexit. I think Brexit has been such a distraction mm. for them. This conservative government would have already joined the U.S. in going after the Iranians. And I think Brexit's the only thing that's been slowing them down. That's an interesting point. All right. Turkey starting to deport captured ISIS fighters, including a U.S. national back home to their home countries. James, what do you think about this? Well, I, th I think it's the right thing to do. I mean, we just can't let these these folks sit around forever in the Middle East in mass numbers. I think sending them back to their countries is the right thing. Different countries have uh, different criteria on whether they can be tried, what they can do with them, if they can be detained. But uh, but if you know they're coming, you know who they are, I think that's a, a far better situation than having them run around in the region. I mean, there are literally thousands of these people. Yeah. Uh, over time, we're going to have to figure out what to do with this population. We just can't leave them sitting there. I, I mean, that so that has been, you know, one of the biggest criticisms of President Trump and, and what happened in Syria and the pullout in Syria. But part of, as he explained, what got him to that point was this idea that you had all of these ISIS fighters sitting in these camps, which our own reporters have been to. And and what are you going to do with them? You know, the countries they came from, for the most part, don't want them back. Right. Um, you know, the Kurds were guarding them, but that could have been to kind of hang on to the territory. What what is if you didn't have a political dog in the fight? What is the solution for those prisoners? What do you do with them? Well, at, at some point, they, they have to be if they're foreign fighters, they, I think they have to be sent back to their, their home countries. You, you just can't leave them languishing in detention there forever. Uh, even if you're even if you're paying other people to detain them, because the problem is that's a that's a potential population that that can be radicalized. And here's the deal. If they're going to leave the country because, you know, the caliphate's fallen apart and they're going to go back to their home country, you want them to go back on your terms, not on their terms. Right. You don't want them sneaking back into the country mm. and hooking up with other people. If you're going to you're going to want to know they're coming back. So you can look after public safety and security in your own country. So an organized retrograde of these people back to their country makes a lot more sense. Now, everybody's the same. You know, we have different situation. A lot of these guys came from Tunisia and Libya, for example. If we dump thousands of foreign fighters in a Tunisia and Libya today, that could be destabilizing. But yeah. to the U.S. and other countries, I think we'd be fine. 
James Carafano, thank you. Thanks for having me.